bà xôm chơi như cười ông chung luôn chung đẹp và cả phần to xạ và nạc cá ông chung luôn chung đẹp và cả cho đo bằng đăng xa tục tựa tàu nâng ca cầm đọc tù xôm chương chạy hạ chạy cầm một bài ca thư sức đầy đi ca mà xôm chương ca cầm đọc tù Ông chúm đông chúm rết là đồng bốn bàn xâm rạch và đoàn dịch tô lưu chung cho ốc cháu xàm sự phạm chân nằm. Bọn tốt mốc ông chúm đông chúm rết bị chà nà khởi hình thà trao cắt bằng thòi phạm chân nằm đào dư lực khởi hình thà miên cao rùm lốp bằng biến lơ xếp rồi bỏ chung cho ốc cháu đai bằng đa lộp bì cà phùng luôn khô nê tê ưu thi đào yếu tổ lạ ca dô thiê nâu cam bí chế chân lọ bì thang ngay tị đọc Sa hạ bởi rìa nhá bàn lực lạng thả Ông chú nông chú rìa sở lạ đờ bốn đã sở thàn từ nguồn tố Mình cực rôn từ lợi phiếp từ nguồn khôn Nịch bọt ủ cực rất ở bàn bởi rứt đòi chôn chôp cháu Nâng tu nịt tì đất nô bởi bọt chôn chôp cháu Nâng chàn tiện nịch ca bởi rứt ủ cực rất ở cam thường đủ Ông chú nông chú rìa sở lạ đờ bốn đã sở thàn từ nguồn tố mình trầm trấu Đói kết sở thàn từ mral chẳng chiếng nâng cầm nọt Tố đã bàn xâm rách đói ông chú nông chú rìa sở lạ đờ bố phía sở đánh Mình miên lẽ gần ạ xong là mốm Nâng khuyên phía chú bác luôn Cụ thể Sở hạ bởi rìa nhá lực xa nào xong thả ông chú nông chú rìa sở lạ kè gặp bút Bì nết kè bài kè gặp nọt tố Đã bàn phư lạ đói ông chú nông chú rìa sở lạ nằm bố Chia kè đã tố quân tình yêu kia ở môi chí vứt Làng vĩnh Bọn cô gặp nọt tố ní Bọn cắt bọn thoi mốc đã tố quân tình yêu kia Nông dạ bê l xa sẽ bàm chân ám Đã bây phát đọt Kà tù tuất xong xa rộp mùi đại bàn khôm khuôn khôn nịt tị vị thị chú bác môn bê kà khôm nợ ô vô tỏ cò Bóng cố ập thà kà kát bọn thòi bọn tọt kà kát bọn thòi bọn tọt thiết trâu thư lai ngoại bàn xong xa rộp chùm phút thân xâm rào đại miên cầm rật đại trâu thử tụ bàn nụ khôn nô dịa nông kà l kà lạ tì xa nây rừng kà đấy đại miên kà kát bọn tòi tô chìa tị bà rì má miên trâm tế bàm chân nam bọn đồ xâm rạch thà chôn chụp cháu đã quân nền địa kia đòi mình miên ca đòi lên đòi miên lệch hẳn lời mấy thời kỳ cà pì cái đấy mình ban đã chậm lời to chi li lệ so tận năng vẫn đang sát tốc bỏ về hết nhà lời mấy thời kỳ cà kia đấy lực làng thả ông chủ nôm chưa sẵn làm bông bật bứt đòi cầm hồ sơ rong khó khăn mình ban bị chà nói ban trầm trấu lơ miệt tra cao sự pram để cầm bồng toàn cam bị chia cho năm pì pon phẩm bồn sẽ hạ bây giờ nhà ban phơi ca chơi lời to thả tiện lấy con bỏ mê thời kỳ cà pì cái đấy đại học miền mua là than cho bác lo, rư mình để dây mình giang tiết khó khăn mình ban làm bình nơi lẽ khăn đầm râu cá chia tệ bạc để mà này mình đắng có bay tới bạc để sờ cho lại ông chùm nôm chùm đe tuổi lá cá cầm phù, giá hạ bây giờ nhá chùm tua phong đại thả tệ lệ co tì pi nơi bọn đằng xa tốc của bọn mê thủy cả pi cái đấy mình trâu cách mình trâu đại tranh pi bọn đằng xa tốc của bọn mê thủy cả pi cái đấy ông pi yết ta thì cả bọn bọc của lại đối chiếu này có bay trở bạn sai cháu đòi mua là hai đôi khi này anh sớm ở cùng mà sớm chơi giờ hạ về đây nhà thưa sẽ đây thay ông pi sarana bận đằng sát tục tiệt tiêu ông ca cũng nát tu sớm chơi Thank you, Mr. President. May it please the court. The first issue that I will deal with and address in respect of sentencing is the matter that was raised by the Supreme Court Chamber in its scheduling order, where we were requested to explore whether and to what extent the 2009 Cambodian criminal code, including Article 668, applies to the determination of the appeals against sentence. In paragraph 4 of Your Honour's order, the underlying issue here in our submission is the 
application of Article 10 and Article 95 of the 2009 Penal Code of this Court. And just so I can reference all of us into the same place, Article 95 of the Cambodian Penal Code states that where a life sentence is reduced on the basis of mitigating circumstances, the sentence cannot be more than 30 years. Article 10 of the 2009 Penal Code provides that a new provision which prescribes a lighter penalty shall be applicable immediately. The second paragraph of Article 668, which I will call the Prevalency Clause, states that in the event of a conflict between other criminal legislation and criminal provisions and the provisions of this Code, the provisions of Book 1 of this Code shall prevail. Now, we submit that in this particular court, Articles 95 and 668 are not applicable to this appeal, and I will explain to you why that is the position, and I may well call upon my learned colleague, obviously, who is an expert in Cambodian legislation, I'm not, um, so certainly in the question session she may become involved in this process too. But to be clear, Article 668, which I've called the Prevalency Clause, which is the clause that says that where other criminal legislation and criminal provisions in force should be applicable to the offence defined and punished under such legislation and provisions, in the event of conflict between other criminal legislation and criminal provisions and the provisions of this Code, the provisions of Book 1 of this Code shall prevail. But the final sentence of Article 668 states that the provision of Paragraph 2, the Prevalency Clause, shall not be applicable to special criminal legislation. The term special criminal legislation refers to this court. The Thus, the drafters of the 2009 Penal Code demonstrate to sentencing here, they would have actually amended the law. Parliament would have amended the law. Parliament didn't do that. What Parliament did was to say that that provision did not apply to this court. So, the argument that we are making is that, article, that in essence, Article 95 of the 2009 Penal Code is not incorporated into the sentencing regime of this court. I would add, and this will be later in my submissions, that in any event, Article 95 is actually irrelevant for your honest consideration. Because our position now is that any mitigating circumstances that exist in this case have frankly reached a vanishing point. And so the provisions of Article 95 in any event would not apply, but I will make those submissions later. We also take the position that Article 95 does not apply to the ECCC because the agreement and the law and the regulations set out the sui generis institution. And indeed, even Judge Laverne, who dissented on sentencing, and stated in his view, wrongly, in my respectful submission that Article 95 applied, determined that this court was sui generis. He stated that in his dissenting opinion. The ECCC agreement and the law are the reflection of extensive negotiations between the government of this country and the United Nations. The agreement and the law set out 
a CUI generous system for sentencing of the accused in this court. If you look at paragraph 574 of the judgment, in this case, you will see that it states that the agreement creates a CI generous sentencing regime. It is therefore doubtful whether on the basis of Article 33 new, the Chamber could follow a subsequent national legislative provision in preference to the provisions of the agreement. Such an interpretation could mean that the future acts of the national legislature concerning sentence might frustrate the agreement. That's at paragraph 574 of the judgment, reinforcing the view that the sentencing regime here is UI The trial chamber further found that the international nature of the crimes which the, for which the accused had been convicted and the uncertainties and complexities evident in the evolution of Cambodian criminal law from the 1956 Penal Code onwards ruled out direct application of Cambodian sentencing provisions. The drafters of the agreement on the one hand and the law on the other made a deliberate decision to depart from ordinary Cambodian penal law on sentencing. They wanted to create a specific regime for this court. Examples of that can be found, for example, the agreement at Article 10, departing from Cambodian penal law in force stating that the maximum penalty at the ECCC is life imprisonment. The maximum penalty of the penal code was not life imprisonment. Also, the ECCC law, Article 3, 3, clarifying that at the ECCC, the sentencing regime for national crimes is stipulated in Articles 38 and 39 of the law. And this again reflects a deliberate departure from the sentencing regime of the 1956 penal code. The absence of reference to national sentencing practices sets the ECCC law and agreement apart from the statutes of other international tribunals, which directs their chambers to look at national sentencing practices for guidance, specifically because they were exclusively and purely international courts. If you look, for example, at the Yugoslav War Crimes Statute, Article 24.1, the penalty imposed by the trial chamber, and now I'm reading from the statute of the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal, the penalty imposed by the trial chamber shall be limited to imprisonment. In determining the terms of imprisonment, the trial chamber shall have recourse to the general practice regarding prison sentences in the courts of the former Yugoslavia. The same reference exists in the Rwanda a tribunal, but having reference to the courts of Rwanda in deciding and determining sentence within the international courts. The omission, Your Honours, of a similar provision in the ECCC law and the agreement further underscores that the intention of the UN and the Royal Government was to set up a CUI generous system. Moreover, if you look at the rules, the regulations of this court made by the judges, it confirms the unique nature of the sentencing regime here. If you look at internal rule 98, it's States, if the accused is found guilty, the chamber shall sentence him or her in accordance with the agreement, the ECCC law, and these internal rules. Applying the framework set out in the agreement, the ECCC law and the internal rules, it's clear that a chamber is empowered to impose a sentence of anywhere between life imprisonment and five years, regardless of its assessment of the arguments pertaining to mitigation. In other words, nothing in the ECC's CUI generous framework requires the chamber 
to reduce life imprisonment sentence to 30 years if he finds that there are mitigating factors to justify a reduction in sentence. The principle of the principle of Lex Meteor has also been raised as a matter of interest for this chamber. Our position is that that particular principle does not require the application of Article 95 of the 2019 Code for the determination of sentences in this court, and this is for the following reasons. The principle of Lex Meteor is understood to mean that if the law relevant to the accused has been amended, the less severe law should be applied. Now, Article 15 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights states in relevant part that if subsequent to the commission of the offences, provision is made by law for the imposition of the lighter penalty, the offender shall benefit thereby. That principle does not apply here, and for a very good reason. And that is because, as I have just stated, those relevant provisions of the 2009 Penal Code do not apply to this Court. Those principles relevant to sentencing do not apply here. This Court is not bound by them, and so the respondent cannot enjoy the benefits of Lex Meteor. And there is authority for this. The Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal addressed this principle in the Dragan Nikolic case. The appeals chamber found that the accused person can only benefit from the more lenient sentence if the law that has changed is binding, since they only have a protected legal position when the sentencing range must be applied to them. The appeals chamber further cautioned in that case that allowing the principle of Lex Meteor to be applied to the sentences of the International Tribunal on the basis of changes in the laws of the domestic system in Yugoslavia would mean that the states of the former Yugoslavia would have the power to undermine the discretion of the International Tribunal. The Chamber found that that outcome would be unacceptable and that it would undermine the primacy of the Tribunal's mandate. It is my submission for the same reasons. When this court was established, the agreement, the law and the regulations provided the sentencing regime for this court. The 2009 provisions for sentencing are not binding on this court, and the accused thus cannot enjoy the more lenient provisions of that code. Now, in addition to the provisions of the court, other international criminal courts have rejected the applicability of the Rome Statute, which is the governing statute of the International Criminal Court and contains a similar provision on sentencing to Article 95, imposing a fixed term of imprisonment for no longer than 30 years, and the ICTR, the Rwanda Tribunal, ruled in the case of Nahimana, N-A-H-I-M, a that that particular rule does not bind the Rwanda Tribunal. So, our submission is, in this particular instance, that this law does not apply to this court. Let's make clear in Rule 668, because this is special criminal legislation in my learned ក្រមនីយមនីទេដូចមានចាយនៅក្នុងមេត្រាប្រមួយ
Mr. President, will we be finishing at 12 o'clock today? For lunch, will we be finishing for lunch today? I will uh, try and finish before the lunch break. Um, I now intend to briefly summarise our submissions on sentencing. We say that the trial chamber discernibly erred in the exercise of its sentencing discretion in arriving at a manifestly inadequate sentence. And we say that the trial chamber made a number of errors in this respect. And I will go through those errors. Um, there are six of them. Uh, the first error is that the <coughs> trial chamber in finding that there were significant mitigating factors that existed that justified a reduction in sentence erred in its determination. They made a mistake. We say that the trial chamber in fact misinterpreted its own findings, and I think if you read the paragraphs concerned, that's paragraph 606 to 611, it will be very clear that they misinterpreted their own findings. They found that there were significant mitigating factors in the conclusion that they made, and yet they rejected or qualified each one of the mitigating factors that they considered save one. Let's look at the first mitigating factor, superior orders and duress. On the facts, the trial chamber rejected superior orders and duress as mitigating factors. And you can see that in paragraphs 607 and 608 of the trial, the trial judgment. The trial chamber found that the accused knew that the orders he received to kill, torture and arbitrarily detain persons protected under the Geneva Conventions were unlawful. And that's paragraph 552 of the trial judgment. The trial chamber also found that the accused willingly and actively participated in the implementation of the policy of terror, and his conduct in carrying out his functions at S21 evidenced a high degree of efficiency and zeal. And that you will find in paragraphs 555 and 557. It should further be noted that the accused's personal belief in the party and his commitments to its goals apparently subsisted even after he left S21 on the 7th of January of 1979. It's paragraph 556. It is granted by us that the trial chamber did report giving limited weight to the coercive climate in democratic Cambodia and the accused's position within the CPK. However, however, the co-prosecutors submit that the weight given to this factor by the trial chamber can only have been minor in light of the related findings in respect of superior authority and duress. For example, if you look at paragraphs 557 to 558 and paragraphs 608, Rejecting duress is defence since the accused was willing and active participant in the implementation of the policy of terror. Remorse. The next mitigating factor. The that the respondent had made repeated public apologies but found that the mitigating impact of his remorse was undermined by his failure to offer full and unequivocal admissions of responsibility and his request for an acquittal at the end of the proceedings. Paragraph 610. The next mitigating factor, the propensity for rehabilitation. The trial chamber noted that international courts have counseled against giving rehabilitation undue weight in mitigation and ultimately accorded what is called 
limited consideration to this factor in its determination sentence. And you will find that in paragraph 611. Cooperation, this factor certainly stands out in comparison with other factors, as it is the only factor that the trial chamber seemed to adopt without any major reservation. You can find that in paragraph 609 of the trial judgment. However, the co-prosecutor submits that the trial chamber erred by giving substantial weight to this factor, even after the belated request for acquittal of the accused at the end of the trial. That appeal by the accused and his challenge to the jurisdiction of this court indicates that his cooperation was not given in a voluntary or selfless capacity. International jurisprudence establishes very firmly what must be fulfilled for a successful plea and mitigation based on cooperation with the authorities. One of these is the selflessness of the accused cooperation, which must be lent without asking for anything in return. My authority for that is the case of Blush, Yugoslavia, Blasinoknong, Yugoslavia, Blasinoknong, Yugoslavia, Blasinoknong, Blasinoknong, Blasinoknong. As I've said, the further elaboration of the accused's position on appeal confirms the very limited or non-existent nature of the mitigating circumstances in this case. In respect of remorse, the accused continued request for release underscores in a case like this involving massive criminality the fact that the accused to this day lacks real, sincere remorse for what happened. Similarly, the accused's assertion that he does not constitute one of those most responsible for serious crimes that occurred during the decay period is inconsistent with the notion that he admits responsibility for the grave crimes for which he is charged. He even goes so far in his own appeal to assert that he was one of the least responsible for the crimes committed during this period. And you'll find that in paragraph 55 of his appellate brief. The accused belated challenge to the legal basis for his prosecution and his request for release highlights, in my submission, the insincere, selective and opportunistic nature of his cooperation with this court. The next error is that the trial chamber erred by giving insufficient weight to the gravity of the respondent's crimes. International criminal courts have repeatedly emphasized that the gravity of the offence is the primary concern in sentencing matters. There are a number of cases on this, in time I only quote two, the case of Mohimana, that's M-U-H-I-M-A-N-A, appeals judgment of the Rwanda Tribunal, paragraph 253. The gravity of the offences committed is the primary consideration when imposing a sentence. The prosecutor in Carrera, K-A-R-E-R-A, -E trial judgment, paragraph 583. The penalty must first and foremost be commensurate with the gravity of the offence. It is our submission that the trial chamber failed to take account of this fundamental principle when determining that the mitigation factors warranted the imposition of a finite rather than a light term of imprisonment.
It is our submission that the gravity of respondents' crimes can be seen in their magnitude, their scope, and their duration. The trial chamber found that the respondent was found guilty for multiple crimes against humanity committed over a period of more than three years, which resulted in the killing of over 12,000 people. Many of whom were tortured before they were executed. The scope of this policy is to make it easier for the accused to be tortured. The accused was instrumental in creating a broad geographic scope extending throughout the Cambodian government has the trial chamber further erred by giving insufficient weight to the aggravating circumstances. The aggravating circumstances in this case include the accused and you'll find that at Hi. paragraph 600 and 605 As the co-prosecutor stated earlier in their submission to the crimes against humanity, the trial chamber by subsuming the various crimes against humanity under the crime of persecution and not directly considering discriminatory intent in respect of all of the other convictions which we say the trial chamber should have made with respect to crimes against humanity, thus considering additional aggravating circumstances in respect of those particular crimes. If the trial chamber had given proper weight to these aggravating circumstances, the only reasonable conclusion, Your Honours, would have been the imposition of a life sentence. The fourth error is that even if very limited mitigating factors did exist in this case, and we say those factors are now, the trial chamber erred by finding that they justified a reduction in the sentence from life imprisonment. International law establishes very clearly that a court need not reduce the sentence on the basis of mitigating circumstances, where the gravity of the crime is especially severe, or where the effect of mitigation is limited or offset by aggravating circumstances. In the Kailili case, spelled out K A J E L I J E L I, appeals judgment. This case found that the trial chamber did not, uh, did not make a mistake in declining to reduce a life imprisonment sentence on the basis of credible mitigating evidence, where that mitigating evidence did not clearly outweigh the gravity of the crimes for which the appellant had been charged and convicted. Another case from the Roman Tribunal is the Nietzsche-Hikka case. I'll spell that N-Y-I-T-E-G-E-K-A. Paragraph 267 of the Appeals Judgment upholding the imposition of a life sentence and stating that nothing prevents the trial chamber from imposing a life sentence in light of the gravity of crimes committed, even if the evidence in the case reveals the existence of mitigating circumstances. Another decision also from the Rwanda Tribunal, the Seema, M-U-S-E-M-A, the Appeals Judgment, Paragraph 396, 
International courts have imposed this maximum penalty in cases of great crimes, even where the accused has cooperated with the court. For example, in the case of the judge's bench, we've seen the case. The trial chain of the family accused has cooperated throughout the proceedings. Through admission of facts, including the fact that genocide had occurred in the region, that issue, and that these admissions had facilitated the expediency of the trial, that he was still sentenced to life in prison because of the nature of the crimes that he had committed. In this case, Your Honours, despite the accused's cooperation, and the existence of other mitigating circumstances, the trial chain of the found that the aggravating circumstances outweighed the mitigating circumstances, and consequently imposed a life sentence. Here I'm talking about Musima. And the appeals chamber upheld this finding. The fifth error is that the trial chamber made a mistake in not considering international sentencing jurisprudence. I've heard the subjects from my own friends across the world. They say that international law does apply. But it's not right when it is held. But international law does apply. For example, they said that Rule 11, that the use of law crimes tribunals to assist their argument in where it's unhelpful, they say it doesn't apply. Well, the fact is, for these kinds of crimes, this court, in my respectful submission, is obliged to look to international jurisprudence because it is where the guidance lies. These courts have been considering these offences for 15 years. They have been considering these offences for 15 years. And in those 15 years, a great deal of jurisprudence has developed and should be relied on to determine the punishments regardless of the fact that this is a Cambodian domestic court with special jurisdictions. We made extensive submissions on international jurisprudence related to the trial chain of the family in these cases. The trial chain is not considered those arguments. They appear not to consider any of the cases that we submitted to the court. We should be considered in coming to a determination of the sentence. The trial chain would not have imposed the manifestly inadequate sentence of 35 years in this case if they had reviewed the sentences of other cases in the trial laws. Indeed, the accused crimes and his level of responsibility clearly placed his case in this case, this category of cases where international courts would have imposed a term of life in prison. To highlight this particular fact, we have reviewed all of the cases where a sentence of life in prison was imposed. We selected from all of those cases seven cases, two from the Yugoslavia Law Crimes Tribunal and five from the Rwanda Tribunal. You can see in front of you a chart. If I could show this please, Mr. President, this is a chart which essentially is a graphical representation of what I'm about to say. Thank you. I'm obliged, Mr. President. Thank you. We selected these seven cases by taking cases where the accused had similar responsibilities to the respondents in this case, and where the number of individuals killed for which the accused was held responsible was ascertainable. In many cases, as you know, that are heard before international courts, it's sometimes very hard to actually determine how many people were killed. So we selected those cases where the courts have found a certain number 
and places of refuge where the population were constantly shifting and migrating and also given the relatively short period over which the genocide had no longer took place a little over three months as opposed to the three years in this case. The ICTR and the one tribunal did not frequently attribute exact numbers killed to these individuals and thus the co-prosecutors did not conclude those cases in our sample because we believe that that would be unfair to the respondent and it would have essentially presented an inaccurate picture to your honours. I will very briefly go through um, each one of these cases. You can see at the far left hand corner is the respondent in this case. On the left hand side it shows the number of dead in this case, 12,500. And next to that, it shows the duration of the crime of three and a half years. And now, if I go through very briefly the case next to Galich, Galich is a case from the Yugoslav Tribunal. He was sentenced to 20 years at trial and life on appeal. He was a military commander and he was convicted of crimes against humanity, being murdered, inhumane acts and war crimes, being inflicted of terror of civilians and war crimes, He was responsible for hundreds of thousands of victims and for the terrorizing the 300,000 residents of Sarajevo. He gave commands to initiate widespread sniper and shelling attacks on Sarajevo. He was responsible for the imprisonment of hundreds of civilians in inhumane conditions. The duration of this criminal conduct is 23 months. If we now look to the next ICTY case that was selected where there was a life imprisonment a trial that was an appeal pending in this case, so the determination of sentence in this case was not final, but at least a trial was sent to life imprisonment. This man was a fairly minor figure. He was a leader of a group of Bosnian Serb paramilitaries. He was convicted of crimes against humanity, persecution, murder, inhumane acts, and extermination, and war crimes of murder and cruel treatment. He was responsible for the murder of at least 132 Bosnian men, women and children and also for the beating of detainees. The murders took place over approximately a one-month period. The beatings over 26 months period. If we now move on to the next case, which is acquiescing, this is a case from ICTR, A-K-A-Y-S-U. This individual received a life sentence at trial, which was confirmed on appeal. He was a mayor of the Tarbon He was convicted of genocide and direct and public yeah, incitement to commit God genocide and crimes against humanity of extermination, murder, torture, rape and inhumane acts. He personally was responsible for the death of approximately 2,000 individuals whilst he was a mayor and individually criminally responsible for the murder of approximately 16 civilians killed on his orders and in his presence. He participated in and encouraged the rape of women and the duration of his criminal conduct was approximately three months. 
The next case, the fourth case, is the Carrera case, also a Rwanda tribunal case. This is an individual that was sent to both the trial and confirmed on appeal to life imprisonment. His position was that of a prefect within a commune in Rwanda. He was convicted of genocide, crimes against humanity, of murder and extermination. And he was found responsible for participation in an instigation of an attack at a church in which hundreds of Tutsi refugees were killed. The duration of his conduct was two months. Clement Kayashima there are four bars for him in this representation before you simply because he received on trial and appeal four concurrent sentences of life imprisonment respecting to his four separate convictions for genocide. He also was a prefect in Rwanda. He was convicted of four counts of genocide. He was found responsible for instigation and contribution to four separate massacres. And you'll see the numbers represented there. The first massacre, 8,000 killed. The second, 4,000 killed. Some estimates place it higher, but we've placed the lowest figure in fairness. The third massacre, 4,000 to 5,000 were killed. The fourth, thousands were killed. The duration of this criminal conduct is as follows. The first three massacres lasted approximately three days. The fourth, where thousands were killed, was an ongoing campaign of violence over three months. The next case, the fourth case, is the Alvas Nurdin case. This is the case of Alvas Nurdin case, also an ICTR case. He was sentenced at trial to life imprisonment. To be fair, he was still pending in that case, so there is not a final determination. He was the commander of the Paramount Commando Battalion. So a battalion commander. He was convicted of genocide, crimes against humanity, murder and extermination. He was responsible for the death of 2,000 individuals in the criminal conduct that lasted for approximately one month. The next case is the Kaiyashima case. 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 And rape, crimes against humanity, war crimes of murder and rape. He was responsible for the death of 140 individuals on at least three separate occasions during which he was involved with the commencement and the cessation of the killings. So he was physically present at the beginning and the end of the killings and he was also responsible for the rape of many women. He was aware that rapes were occurring within his prefectorial district and he made remarks encouraging sexual abuse and that criminal conduct was over a period of approximately three months. If, with your permission, Mr. President, I can show two other graphics, which essentially are the same as these, but I think make the picture of what I've just painted a lot clearer. Yes, I'm going to show you the next slide. This is the next slide. Thank you, Mr. President. This particular graphic you see represents very clearly the numbers killed in comparison to all of these other cases. You will see here that the respondents, the number of kills, the number of dead for which this individual is responsible far outseed, exceeds any of these other cases that I've quoted. And lastly, 
if I can show the other diagram, the duration of this man's conduct exceeds by far any of these other cases. The sixth error is that the trial chamber erred in failing to recognize that a sentence of 35 years does not meet the two principal goals of international sentencing, namely retribution and deterrence. And when I speak of retribution, Your Honours, I'm not speaking of re revenge. I'm speaking about the expectations of the Cambodian people. In respect to this court, international sentencing practices must ensure that convicted perpetrators see their crimes punished, that victims' interests are vindicated, and that others who may be tempted to commit atrocities are forever dissuaded. International courts have consistently found that their sentencing practices must be directed first and foremost at retribution. The rationale underlying these goals is to ensure that convicted perpetrators see their crimes punished and to dissuade them from others who may be tempted to commit the international community will not tolerate serious violations of international human rights. And you will find that in paragraph 906 of the Muslim judgment in the U.S. International courts have consistently noted that the weight must be given to other sentencing purposes. I believe I demonstrated that a sentence of 35 years must be inadequate in the duration of the sentence. Finally, Your Honour, my submission at the end of the beginning. So this change should impose a life of imprisonment that is, of course, reduced to take account of the period of illegal detention by the Cambodian military. But we call for the imposition of a life term, reduced to 45 years simply to take account of the period of illegal detention. The purposes of history must be imposed in this case for all of the reasons that I stated. It is perfectly proper in to reduce a life term to a finite term of years. Thank you, Mr. President. I think I'll be finished before then, but thank you so much. In the case of Kailili, the situation that was taken in June, K-E-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-J-L-I-
nấu đông đồng bốn nay đậm lạc anh đi tại vị thí ní ca sĩ mà sa lâm ảnh cứ lúc yên on behalf of the united nations man trong cambodian people I from the United Nations uh, and one of the officials working here together with my Cambodian colleagues. But you also open these proceedings on behalf of the Cambodian people. And it is to the Cambodian people that ultimately we must answer their need for justice, their need for retribution, their need for retribution, their need for reconciliation. In essence, it's not the prosecutors that are pleading from the God. It is the Cambodian people. And it is for them, Your Honours, that you must, in this case, based on the trial chamber's finding on the gravity of the crimes to which this man is responsible, and the related aggravated facts, in particular, his superior position and his discriminatory intent, we submit that you must in impose in this case a life term reduced to no less than 45 years. That is the appropriate penalty in this case. I thank you, Mr. Sessman, for listening to my submissions. I am now complete, and I thank you for the vote. Thank you for the vote. ອົງຈຸນົນບຣັດຕະລາກາກປູລເອີ້ສົມປະກາດສໍາລະປີນີ້ໃຫ້ໃນບັນຕໍໃນມາອົງ 13:30 Some change, Krakchow.